Hey, Joe. Don't worry. Hello. How's everyone doing? Good. How are you? Doing well. Long day. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I was working for a, you know, U.S. California-based company before, but then now that I'm at a global company, I'm seemingly meeting with the rest of the world at all hours. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Stephen, how are you? Hello. We're excited about your presentation today. Thank you. Thank you. I'm uh, quite excited to be here. So you don't mind if we record it, Stephen, and put it up on our web site? Yeah, absolutely. Great. Absolutely here. So let me open my uh, presentation. How is everyone tonight? Doing well. Doing well. Excellent. Was it about 5.30 for, for all you yeah. folks? Yeah. I had some heartburn earlier today, upgrading <laughs> oh, no. to uh, R4.2 and then updating my packages. And then oh, no. Eggs. Yeah, no, it all worked out. <laughs> I, uh, I have deliberately held back at the moment because uh, I yeah. noticed... Uh, I think I have to update our tools to four two as well. Yeah, so I have uh, held back for the moment. Yeah. We should get your own to do a talk on our tools at some point. That might be interesting. Yeah, that would. Yeah. Be, that, I think that would be pretty good, actually. I actually love that idea. I've done very little with proper R tools outside of just using it in package development. Like I've never done anything advanced with it, in my opinion. It, neither have I, but I've heard, you know, it can be quite powerful. But uh, like you, I only use it because I need it for, for development. I've never really gone under the hood to... Uh, mess around with it. Do we want to give a, a couple more minutes uh, or? Yeah, I would wait. It's kind of early for some people, so. Gotcha. Um, just... How long is your talk? Um, I was told it should be about the uh what was the whole thing was an hour so about 45 for the presentation 15 minutes for q a is cool. that is that appropriate yeah that sounds great okay so we're not time crushed or anything like that it's okay yeah i, I ran through it at lunch today uh to see you know to make sure i was inside the uh inside the the time frame there If you run a little over, don't, don't worry about it. Uh, you, don't, you don't need to right. speed things up at the end. It's, we don't have to leave the room. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the custodians that are coming, kind of coming through and kick us out. Yeah, true, true. <laughs> I think what I'm uh, I'm gonna do is uh, once we start the meeting, I'm gonna remove the ability to unmute um, for participants, and then um, I'll just make an announcement. If anyone wants to ask a question, just like raise the hand or uh, put it on chat. Okay. okay. Sure. Yeah, we got a little zoomed bomb last time. Not too bad, but. Uh, Pablo, I, I didn't have a chance to download the 
uh, the slides. So if you don't mind. Yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, okay, I'll perfect. do that. Thanks. What do you do for your day job, Steve? Uh, for my day job, I'm a, a data scientist at a, a community hospital here on Long Island. Okay. Um, so it keeps me uh, pretty busy. We're in the middle of a, uh, a merger right now. We're being uh, taken over by NYU Langone. Um, we were the last uh, community hospital on the island. And, uh, you know, as things, uh, you know, COVID really... Uh, hit us pretty hard and it just sort of made things uh, unsustainable. So we had to put ourselves uh, uh, up for sale. So what makes a community hospital a community hospital? The size really, we're, we're really quite small. You know, we have uh, licensed beds of about, uh, I think 306, but our daily occupancy is typically only about a 120, which is, uh, small compared to say, uh, you know, like uh, Mass General or Stony Brook University Hospital, which would see, you know, three or 400 patients a day plus just in their ER. It may have, you know, 400 people, 500 people in house on any given day. So we're really, it's the, it's the size. We're really very small compared to the teaching hospitals. Hmm. Interesting. I thought community hospitals were ones that were basically funded by the government. Uh, we do most of our most of our uh, revenue does come from the government in, in terms of uh, uh, Medicare, uh, Medicaid, and uh, what they call uh, dish payments, which are uh, what they call disproportionate share hospitals. So we we typically see a lot of patients that have. Uh, uh, no insurance. Uh, we serve a large area of zip codes that are um, um, fairly, you know, close to the poverty line. Uh, so, uh, you know, most of uh, most of those accounts, you know, we don't get paid on. So, uh, the government sort of picks up the tab for that. Mm, interesting. Yep. What does that mean for your analytics team? The merger? Will you be mo moving into like a larger, better structured team, or? Um, I, I, yeah, so right now we have, there's only two uh, analysts at the hospital. There's one that's more of our data warehouse person who is my, my counterpart. And then I'm the only one that does any statistical work or forecasting at the hospital. So after the merger, um, you know, it, it, that'll be a lot more uh, well-defined. Um, is you know we're about two thousand employees, where NYU is close to fifty thousand. So it's a much much larger uh, system. We don't really know where things are going to play out yet um, because we're only two months in out of thirty six. So it's about another thirty four months before the merger is actually uh, finalized. Cool. What do you guys think? Get started or wait a few more minutes? Yeah, I think 
we should get started. Um, okay. If it's okay, I will uh, give some introductions, Steve, and then um, uh, give it up to you. Sure. So let me share my screen here. All right. So welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today for the Southern California R Users Group Meetup. Uh, the topic for today is an introduction to the Healthiverse packages. And um, we're very excited to have Steve here. Uh, before, the, before his talk, I just wanna make, uh, go through our intro slides here very quick. So a little bit about the schedule. We're, we're running a little bit late, but that's okay. Uh, we're flexible. I think uh, the ability to being online uh, provides some flexibility. So, you know, just here a couple of minutes uh, to do some welcome and announcements, and then we'll go into his, uh, into his talk. Uh, about an hour, like we said, Steve, uh, we're very flexible. Um, give your talk some time for, for Q&A. So um, very flexible here. Uh, let's see. So we want to thank our sponsors. Uh, we have uh, the UCI Pomerage School of Business. We work closely with their uh, Masters of Science in Business Analytics program. Uh, they, we've been working with them for, for a couple of years now, and uh, we're very grateful for, for their support. Another one of our sponsors is the UCI Masters of, of Data Science. Uh, their, our collaboration is it's newer with them, but same, it's a pleasure uh, to work with that team and uh, we're very grateful for, for their support. Uh, connect with us. We have our, our website here. We have a GitHub, we have Slack. Uh, YouTube, we're, we're recording this meeting. We will be posting that to, to YouTube. You can follow us on, on Twitter and LinkedIn. So just take a look, take a screenshot there if you want to um, for yeah, connect with us online. Very well. So now um, let's see here. Oh. We're gonna, I'm gonna pass this time to to Javier, he's gonna make an introduction to, to Steven and, and the topic for today. Thanks, Pablo. And yeah, thank you, Steven. We're uh, excited about your Healthy Verse presentation. So uh, Steven Sanderson is here to present a meta package he's created, the Healthy Verse, uh, to help hospitals analyze and visualize their data and also to perform um, you know, statistical inference off it. Uh, it's tidy friendly and, um, you know, there's some very neat functions in it for uh, data analysts, data scientists and, and actuaries. Um, and in fact, I think that's how Stephen and I first met through uh, Matt Dancho's sort of mm -hmm. model time and business science university uh, framework. So Matt presented last last month, and uh, I thought it would be a good follow up for for Steve to present. Uh, Steve is Stephen is a data scientist at NYU uh, Langone Health in Long Island. Uh, he writes SQL and R scripts for reporting and analysis, and we're really excited to have you here. So we'll pass it over to you now. Uh, thank you so much. Um... Here, I'll just uh, share my screen so we can see the presentation. Let's see here. Share. Well, here, we'll go like this. Share. Okay. Uh, can you see the uh, screen? Give me a thumbs up. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Um, so thank you for the introduction. Um, and as mentioned, um, this is a, a presentation for everybody to understand what the healthy verse uh, currently is, you know, what its thought was and, and uh, the direction that I, I really hope that it sort of goes in. Uh, the healthy verse at the moment, there are, uh, let's see, healthy RTS, data. there's five packages currently. 
that uh, make up the sort of healthy verse um, with another one uh, uh, coming in the way soon. Um, so <clears throat> a little bit more about me. Um, I received my Bachelor of Economics from the State University of New York at Stony Brook, uh, which is itself a uh, tertiary academic uh, medical center. Um, after that, uh, I took a year off and then decided to go back and receive my master's in public health from the same university um, where I focused on uh, data analysis and statistics. Um, currently, uh, as mentioned, I'm the data scientist at uh, NYU Langone Health at Long Island Community Hospital. Uh, I also run a, a small sort of a niche consulting firm called Manchu Technologies, where I write SQL and R um, right now strictly for hospitals in their finance departments. Um, as this uh, talk is about, I do, uh, I am the currently the sole developer for the health, healthy verse packages. Um, as things start to mature, uh, I sort of hope that uh, will change in the future. Um, pull requests are uh, always welcome. Um, I'm also a researcher for FM Tangerman LLC, um, which focuses more on um, um, sort of like niche products, uh, um, government related, sometimes uh, energy and um, uh, financial market uh, related matters. Uh, you'd like, here are some links uh, that you can take down where you can um, reach me. I'm on GitHub and LinkedIn every day. Um, I try to, uh, you know, commit some code every day, you know, some shape or form. Um, I post um, typically Monday through Friday uh, on LinkedIn, try to post some helpful uh, functions or things that I find, uh, you know, could be useful and, you know, maybe useful for other people as well. Uh, I do keep a personal site, uh, spsanderson.com. A um, little bit more. Uh, obviously, my interests are in data analysis and uh, obviously R, um, which I use seven days a week. Um, probably too much, but that's okay. Uh, I also an avid Plex uh, user. I maintain a quite an extensive server at home. It's a nice little hobby. It's where I keep all my music to uh, sort of keep me focused and, and going all day long, um, specifically with music. Uh, I'm closing in on 89,000 songs. It's, uh, it's uh, still too small. More is always welcome. Um, so, <clears throat> How did I really get started? Um, I got started with R right after I finished my economics degree. I took a position at a, another uh, community hospital that it was at the time um, where uh, my employer there wanted me to run all sorts of analysis uh, as they were growing what's called their hospitalist program. So we had to see, you know, were there uh, statistical differences in the way employed physicians operated versus uh, what they call uh, volunteer physicians, those that maintain their own private practice and have admitting privileges at a hospital. So in my interview, they asked me if I knew SQL and any other, you know, programming languages for analysis. And, uh, you know, so I said, of course I do, no problem at all. Um, you know, the reality was uh, a little bit different, uh, you know, but uh, fresh out of college, I thought I'd give it the old, uh, you know, the old college effort. Um, thankfully, there are things like Stack Overflow and Google searching to save the day. So, <clears throat> As we all know, we're going to talk about the healthy verse. Um, and here are the packages as they stand uh, as of today. So healthy R, which is um, 
sort of like the base package. We'll get into that. It's currently in version 1.9. Uh, it is an experimental package, uh, so it is not yet stable, and I do not think it will be stable for um, quite some time yet. There's still a lot of things that I want to do with it, a lot of things, uh, a lot of directions um, that sort of need to be narrowed down. LTR.data uh, is a simulated data set. This is a stable package, um, and it is... Uh, I spent actually quite a long time simulating this data set to make it as real as possible uh, so that uh, researchers and the like could use it to build um, statistical models, machine learning models for time series or um, you know, classification models, that sort of thing. HealthyR.ai is sort of another component to the Healthyverse that I want to use as the machine learning component. Um, so the Healthyverse uh, I see is like a modular kind of universe of packages. Uh, HealthyR.ts is a time series package, um, which relies heavily on things like model time, time TK, and uh, other tidy models uh, uh, packages. So. Uh, the, the idea is to sort of move away from things like Carrot uh, as, as our studio specifically moves towards, uh, you know, really pushing tidy models. So I really wanted uh, Healthy R, AI, NTS to sort of integrate as easily as possible into them. Um, AI, NTS are both still experimental as well. Tidy density, on the other hand, is a stable package and tidy density is really um, is really just for distributions. So taking a look at uh, distributions that are in base R and distributions that come with the uh, package ActuR, which is uh, for loss data analytics. So think, think insurance companies. Um, and really I wanted a sort of unified way to kind of make these two work together in the tidyverse and make them easier to use. You know, you have functions like R norm, P norm, Q norm, D norm. And so I wanted to sort of take all those functions and kind of squash them down to one. And we'll 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 see a little bit about that. So <clears throat> the first package that I created was healthy R. And the desire of this package really is to be um, sort of a, a consistent verb framework that is uh, easy to understand and low code. Uh, many times at, uh, at hospitals, uh, especially community and rural hospitals, their access to data scientists or, or analysts is, is very slim. A lot of them don't have the the real uh, uh, budget for it. So I wanted all of the packages really to be simple for anyone to use. The function name should be indicative of what's going to happen and it should take care of everything for you. Now, this doesn't mean that you shouldn't know how to program at least a little bit, but I really tried to abstract away and continue to try to abstract away as much of that as possible to make things uh, easier and, and quicker. Um, being in this field for so many years, I'm aware of a lot of the sort of bottlenecks um, that, that, that people come up with at, at hospitals. So <clears throat> the first sort of workflow that we're gonna talk about for healthy R is something called a LOSRA index. So that stands for length of stay, uh, readmit index plot. So length of stay uh, for a hospital is really just the average length of time a patient is admitted to a bed. And the readmit rate is um, the rate at which patients come back as an inpatient to the hospital within 30 days post-discharge. These are two measures that are looked at 
um, quite acutely by all executives and, and medical department chairs at hospitals. Not only do they have clinical implications, but they also many times have large financial implications. So the length of stay is going to have its own rate, but it will also have its own benchmark. So from there, you can get an index. Are you above or below the uh, expectation? Readmission rates work the same exact way. So what we're seeing here is just some simulated data so we can uh, run through the functions. This summary that we're now seeing is uh, put together by a function called LOS RA index summary table. You give it your data, just like you would pipe through in, in any typical fashion. And there is a uh, argument called max LOS. So that is, that is sort of uh, uh, the, max, the maximum number you want the table group to. You won't know that, you know, I won't know what some other hospital will need that set at. So that, that is uh, to be known by the person using, using the function. For me, where I am, I know the maximum should be 12 days. But maybe at Stony Brook, it should be 10 days. Really, the only people that will know that are the people analyzing their specific data. So what it does is it will group um, the data you feed into it up to the maximum length of stay, and it will give you the index of the expectation at each uh, length of stay. It will give you the length of stay index and the readmit index, and then it will give you the variance between the two. So well, think, why, why is that important? Why do we want to know that? Well, <clears throat> because then we can plot it out and say, okay, if our length of stay is, our, our index is too low, are people being readmitted quick, which would be indicative of discharging a patient too fast? If the index is high, going along the y-axis, we could say, okay, maybe the readmission rate is low, but they're staying here too long, which has financial implications because hospitals get paid typically by what's called a DRG. So let's say you come in with sepsis, your septic patient, and your DRG is, I don't know, eight, nine, seven, we'll call it. That DRG, at least here in New York, is going to be paid at a specific rate, and that's it. So you don't want to have the patient stay too long, otherwise you're losing money every day. But you don't want to kick them out too fast because then you haven't you haven't properly optimized them, and they're just going to return because they didn't get the appropriate amount of clinical care. So what this does is this is showing you on this vertical line where the minimization takes place. So you have them here at the hospital as long as you should while minimizing the chance that the patient is going to be readmitted within 30 days. So it's sort of a barometer of like, okay, I wanna sort of stay in this area. I'm, I'm treating them as well as I should be and they're not coming back without keeping them here too long and costing yourself a ton of money. Uh, the average cost to run a bed in the hospital is about a million dollars a year. So we can see how that would add up quick. Um, the next topic we can, we'll can discuss in this one is k-means. So k-means, if you're unfamiliar, is a way of finding clusters in your data. So we'll have k non-overlapping clusters. Of course, you can have, uh, you know, set k equal to n, and then you will have n clusters that are non-overlapping, but that doesn't really make any sense. So think about like a bank, maybe they wanna give out credit cards. They wanna cluster people into high income, you know, medium income and low income. It's a clustering problem. These same things exist in healthcare. Um, we're gonna discuss specifically the scree plot, also known as an elbow plot. Now what I did here, this specific elbow plot <clears throat> is going to show Okay, here about three or four clusters 
that, that's really that's really how much how much uh, uh, how many clusters are in our data for the data set that I used here. On the y-axis is the total within sum of squares. Let's you know, think of that as, as that's the error. So at what point can we minimize our error, but without having, you know, too many, too many clusters? We could say 15. Sure, that minimizes it. But well, for this particular data set, that would mean every service line is its own cluster. That's not really how you use the algorithm. So this this elbow plot is going to help show you where the appropriate amount of clusters are in your data. Uh, for that specific example, I used uh, the uh, Healthy R data library with its data set, Healthy R data. In there are things like service line, uh, payer group, so like think Medicare, commercial, HMO, et cetera. And to get that elbow plot, what we do is we use a function in Healthy R called K means map tibble. And you can give that, um, you can give that an N of whatever you want. Uh, you can give it 15 is what I think I set it defaults to. And so what it does is for every N, it will run the k-means algorithm against the data you have supplied it. And that's how we get the, the scree plot. And then, you know, just pipe that into the next function. Now, <laughs> And I, I'm sorry, I'm moving a little quick here, but we have a lot to cover. Um, the next thing I'm gonna talk about is the magic chart. Um, um, maybe many of you have heard of the Gartner magic uh, quadrant chart, maybe some haven't, um, but I have built this function into healthy R. This right here is what the function call looks like. You have a data argument, so I just made a random X, Y tibble. You provide it your X column, your Y column, your X label, your Y label. You can give it a plot title. And then here is your top right label, your top left label, your bottom left label, and your bottom right label. That's where you'll see, see things like uh, niche or leader, et cetera. And this is what the plot looks like. For healthcare, this is important because we can say, okay, if we have uh, our data aggregated by provider, we can say, okay, all of our providers up in here have both high readmit rates and high length of stay. But all of the providers down here have low readmit rate and low length of stay. Now, if all the uh, if the the average acuity of the patients is the same, we can then say, okay what are these providers doing that is different from the rest? And so you can query them and say, you know, okay, so what are you doing with your patients that you're able to optimize them uh, faster than everybody else? And that starts the conversation going where you can then spread that knowledge around. So this is a very quick way to find out uh, at any data set that you provided, what's going on, who's the leader, know, who's maybe lagging. Now we're going to move on uh, to healthy RTS. Like I said, this, this package is experimental. Uh, again, I wanted this to be a sort of uh, easy to use verb framework uh, for time series modeling, where we can sort of rapidly prototype stuff if you don't want to work through the, uh, the model time or tidyverts uh, frameworks. Um, many times at, at smaller hospitals, you won't have somebody that really has a lot of knowledge of time series, but they may have enough to, to run through these and say, okay, this makes sense, or no, this doesn't make any sense at all. So what we're gonna do uh, in this section is actually go over the process of tuning a um, time series model. Um, R itself comes with a few time series uh, data sets. One of them is the air passengers data set. Uh, I believe it's 144 months worth of air travel. 
Now, uh, another thing to, to remember is that even though Bazaar has time series objects, healthy RTS, since it you know, works well with the tidyverse, expects a tibble. So we have to convert things to a tibble, which is no problem. Uh, as I created a function called TS to tibble. So time series to tibble. All you have to do is feed it your time series object and it will automatically convert it to a tibble. Uh, this, the air passenger object had a start and end um, uh, attribute to it. So this function will create the index. And here I just selected it off, chose not to, to bring it in. So this TS to tibble will convert a TS object, XTS, zoo, and MTS objects to tibbles. <clears throat> now this is the part of the uh, part of the model time framework. Um, so we'll just kind of. Sorry, um, yes. there's a question on the chat uh, sure. for slide twenty. Is there a way to plot the magic chart with different size dots relative to variation or sample size at the locations? There is not, but if you want to put in a GitHub uh, ticket for it, please do, and I will work on it. That's a um, thank you. That's a yeah. That's a really good one. Who, whoever asked that, please put in a, a GitHub. That request. was a no. question from Elizabeth. Yep. All right. Elizabeth, I will, uh, if you post that as an issue, I'll work on it. Thank you. Um, okay, so like I said, this will go through a little quicker because this is part of the model time. We create our splits object, which has our, our training and our, our testing and uh, analysis data in it. Um, We'll create the recipe. So I made another function called TS auto recipe. So time series auto recipe. And it automatically creates four recipe objects. Um, I'm un in the process of sort of working through them a little bit to make them a little better. But the point uh, that I was trying to do with them is so that you don't have to make your own recipe. You can just sort of use this and you get four fairly robust uh, recipes that you can use in your models. All you have to provide it is your data table, the column that holds the date and the column that holds the value you're trying to model. Um, so here from the auto recipe, the first object only has, uh, I think it's just the, the outcome and a predictor. Like I said, there, there's a total of four that come out in this function. Now, in tidy models, there's workflow sets where you can take sets of recipes and sets of model specifications and put them together and uh, really do like a, uh, a cross of them. So you get a you know, permutation of recipes and models. So I decided that um, that was uh, too much work, even though it's pretty simple. Uh, if I know I want to say make a, a you know a Mars model of recipes, I just I don't want to have to go through create a bunch of recipes, create a bunch of models, put it together. I just want to use TS workflow set Mars, and this will automatically make um, the workflow sets object for you. You give it uh, the model type for Mars, it's Earth. Uh, you give it your recipe list, which can just use TS auto recipe, which will give you four uh, recipes in a list format. Um, you can um, play around with the tuning parameters of the specific uh, algorithm. Uh, but I tried to set reasonable defaults so that you really don't have to uh, think about it too much. A lot of healthcare data sort of follows a similar pattern no matter where you're at. So I'm really trying to make it as easy for the user as possible. So here we create it. And see, all I did was give it the model type Earth and the recipe list that we created a couple of slides before. And boom, here's our workflow set. It gives the recipe name and the uh, algorithm name. So 
recipe base Mars, a recipe date Mars, a date foyer, which as adds a foyer term based off of the uh, uh, off the date column, and then a, a foyer uh, near zero variance um, uh, recipe. Um, because uh, in one of them, I had a, a very large time signature. So it looks, you know, there's, you know, close to zero variance in the column. It drops it because it's not really going to add anything uh, to your model anyways. Uh, like I said, I tried to give reasonable defaults. And the reason I did that is because a lot of, uh, again, a lot of hospital data is very similar um, on average, I'm sure you'll have your sort of, you know, niche hospitals that only do one thing or serve a very specific population. But, uh, you know, most of the time that's not the case. Most of the time it, it follows a pretty similar pattern. Uh, again, here's the model time workflow. Here, what we're doing is we're just uh, fitting the models to the training set um, and then it's important to sort of do this is to kick out any models that are null, uh, as it can happen that um, let's say you're running an ETS model. If alpha for some reason is less than beta, you're not going to get a model um, because uh, that the alpha always has to be greater than beta for an ETS model to work. So that'll cause it to fail and you'll get a null. I haven't solved that yet so that um, you don't have to go through that step, but there's something I'm working on. You get your model time table, the recipe name, and the algorithm. Recipe name, algorithm. And these are all fitted to the uh, training data. The next part, you get the, you get the calibration data. So this is where you get your metrics. Uh, you run all of the uh, fitted models from the training data against the testing data. Okay, now back to the uh, healthy RTS workflow. Let's say we've we looked at the results of the different models and we say, okay, you know, I like model one. It seems to be fairly accurate and it seems to be um, relatively stable compared to the rest. So now why don't we try to tune it? Well, you could do that. Uh, by hand if you wanted, but that takes too long. And like a uh, good programmer, I'm lazy. So I wrote this function, so I don't have to do it iteratively. Let the computer do it for us. That's why we invented them. Uh, so the function is called TS model auto tune. That's from the uh, TS package. What you do is you give it your model ID, which is the model time ID, we chose number one, and that comes from the calibration table, which you also feed to it. You give it your splits object, drop training NA. So if your training data set has NAs in it, you want to drop them. Uh, it could cause the model to fail if there's NAs in there, or it could just give spurious results. Uh, so that is defaulted to true. You can, of course, set it to false if you want. We provided the date column. And we provided the column that's being predicted, modeled. So whatever the value is, it could be uh, you know, monthly returns in a, in a portfolio or a uh, number of discharges in a month. Then we, for the time series cross-validation, what do we want to assess? Typically in hospitals, you want to go by month and you want to assess 12 months. And you want to skip three months so that you have a little will break in the, in the data. If you have a parallel package installed, um, you can set your number of cores. So this process will, by default, uh, the number of cores is set to one, but you can set it to whatever you have available and the algorithm, you know, the, the function will run in parallel. Uh, I have tested it numerous times. It does work uh, pretty well. Um, so what just happened using that one function with those, with those presets put in? Well, you just automatically tuned all the parameters of the 
uh, Mars model that you have run. You didn't have to think about it. The tuning grid was created. The, the tuning grid was, was uh, optimized and then it was, uh, you know, the function found the best parameter set. Uh, that comes from using the, the uh, tune package from tidy models. The function does give a large set of outputs. So there's, it comes in a list object and there's like three sections of that list. There's the data, there's the model information, and then there are plots. So you can see what happened. In the data section, you get your calibration table from the model time workflow. So the calibration table is where the model is being fitted to your training data. You get the calibration tuned table. So you get the calibration data after the model has been tuned. You get your time series cross validation table. You get your tuned model results. You get the whole, the whole set. You get the best tuned results. And then you get the R sample object back, the time series cross validation object. On the model uh, portion of the output, you get the model specification. It will spit out what parsnip engine was used and for Mars, it's Earth. Uh, the plucked model, so this is the model that you entered up front. In this example, it was number one. So it will give you that, pardon me, that model back. Uh, so you know which one you used uh, to, to uh, Go through the tuning process. You get the tuned workflow specification. So you get the workflow spit back out with all the hyperparameters tuned. You get the actual tuning grid that was used in the process. Um, all these functions use the um, um, grid Latin hypercube. I find it to be um, better than grid random, uh, etc. You also get the tuned time series cross validation workflow because you know a few different things that happened. In the plots, you get the tuning grid plot. So you can see on the metrics how well the model did over the tuning parameters. And you get the cross validation plan. Um, this link uh, will take you there. I will. Uh, Javier, I will send a, a link. I have it on the GitHub, the presentation, so anybody can look and click around and, uh, and go through it at their own, own time if they wish. Perfect, thank you. So that's all for Healthy RTS that, that we're gonna discuss. There's quite a bit of functionality in that program and I have just released an update to it, which brings a whole new set of uh, functions called boilerplate, where I try to um, abstract away even more and really automate that whole entire process we just went through. Uh, and I use um, what uh, are deemed fairly reasonable defaults for recipes, et cetera. Now, Healthy R AI, the next section of the, of the Healthy Verse, is um, I guess what you could say is we're really hoping it'll be like the, the pi caret in Python, but, but for R. This is where I'm spending uh, most of my time at the moment. Uh, I actually wrote a couple of functions today um, where I'm trying to automate um, the K nearest neighbor algorithm to provide uh, again, provide that using the tidy models framework and all in a tidy fashion. So the desire really of this package is to be, again, a consistent verb framework that uh, integrates well with tidy models and the tidy verse. Uh, it is experimental. I think it's only version 0 0.006 right now. So it's uh, you know very low, but uh, uh, it is being quite actively developed. Um, so there's a couple of things we'll talk about with this package. Uh, one is the uh, histogram facet plot, the uh, PCA your recipe uh, function, and a work sort of workflow that's uh, you know comparing a distribution of x, some some 
you know, random variable. I think in this presentation, I use uh, miles per gallon from the empty cars data set. So the histogram facet plot, this is the function call. There are quite a few things that you can change. Um, first of all, you provided your data. How many bins do you wanna see? Again, you sort of have to know your, your data to pick that. I chose 10, it's, it works typically pretty good. Um, scale data, um, do you want the data to be scaled? Um, this will be for a, from zero to one inclusive. So it's a zero one scale. Uh, the number of columns you want, because it is faceted. Um, you can set the factor reorder to either uh, true if you want. Uh, here, the default is false. Same with factor reverse is false. Um, I think those defaults for everything I've done seem to work fairly well. You can set the fill, the color, uh, the scale is set to free, which, um, course you can change and interactive is set to false but if you want an interactive plotly graph you just change dot interactive to true so <clears throat> let's look at the iris data set all you have to do is call the function and enter your data frame and out the graph comes uh, this is this data is not scaled you can see at the bottom on the x-axis goes past one, so we know you know it's not scaled. So let's look at it at scale. Shape changes a little bit, but we notice the x-axis, um, except for this this factor over here, the numeric stops at one. So sometimes that could be that could be useful for you. Uh, it all depends really on your use case. This is a link to the uh, a link to the function on, on, on the website. So if you want to read more about it, you can just go there. Now we're going to talk about PCA your recipe. This one I spent a lot of time on. Um, a, a lot of people have found it useful. Uh, so principal component analysis is transforming a group of variables into a set of new artificial features or components. You're, what you're trying to do with this is capture the maximum amount of information, the variance uh, in your original variables. The data should be, I say should, uh, be normalized before you, you feed it to this function. Um, but you don't have to do it because it'll do it for you. It does return a list invisibly, so you're going to have to assign it uh, to a variable. Um, so we're going to test it out. And what we did is I, I just used the healthy art data. Uh, I selected the visit end date time, which was a discharge, and we get end. So this is discharges by month. How many discharges a month? Uh, we split the data, 80 uh, 20 split make a, a simple recipe here, time signature recipe. So now let's PCA the recipe. You give it your recipe object and your data. Uh, these are the 13 items that are returned with this function. Uh, it returns them in a list, uh, as they do with a lot of functions, they return list objects. Uh, I do that specifically because I hope to return a, as much useful information as possible in one go. What we're gonna look at here are the plots that are returned uh, from this function. The plots are also returned in uh, interactive, so plot only plots, but we're just looking at the, uh, the static. Uh, the PCA screen plot <clears throat> is going to show you uh, how many principal components make up the threshold you set. So the function automatically sets the threshold at 75. So as the subtitle says, typically your last PCA, or your first red one, so PCA4 is 
going to be your last PCA to make up to pardon me, make up your threshold. So at this point, you have captured at minimum 75% of the variation. Uh, we went over that. Here's the loadings plot. So this is the, the coefficient uh, values of the linear combinations. Um, as we saw before, for, for this specific example, the, these first four captured the, uh, uh, these four principal components captured the threshold. Gives you the, the, uh, the variable name here uh, and the principal components in the direction um, that they're going. This is a top end loading spot, so you can select the n can be it's it defaults to to five, but you can set it to to two, three, or you know whatever n you choose. Um, and it shows the the x-axis is the absolute value, um, so it's color coded. If it's red, that means it's really negative, um, and green it is positive, as it shows in the in the uh, legend. Now, remember the loadings are co uh, co finished coefficients in lim linear combination, uh, predicting a variable of your standardized components. So if you don't standardize beforehand, that's okay. The function will do it for you. And if you want more information on PCA, here's a little link to, uh, to a stat quest. The distribution comparison uh, is the next uh, thing we're going to talk about. Use uh, I'm using MPGs for the MT cars. We feed it to this function, uh, HAI distribution comparison. You can choose a distribution to compare it to. Uh, there are many supported ones. I won't go over them all. We're just going to pick on beta. Uh, you can choose to normalize the data. It will use the uh, scale zero one vec. We did it up here just to show that the function exists. So I chose false here, but if this was true, then this is what would be running under the hood. Uh, that gives us our distribution comparison uh, tibble. And we wanna look at the density plot here. So we use get density data tibble. So that gets the density data from this tibble. We want to look at the plot, so let's look at the density plot. You can uh, set this to true and it will return a plotly plot. Um, went over that. Uh, like I said, this, this function is, this package is experimental. I may move this over to tidy density, I'm not sure. Um, but there will be, just like in Tidyverse, if I do do that, there will be ample warning. Um, <clears throat> here's what the output of the uh, distribution comparison looks like. It's a, a sort of a, a tibble of lists. Gives you your distribution data right here and the density object. Um, the density object, uh, the N is set to 512, which is the default for the density function. I haven't decided if uh, I will write anything to let the, to let the user choose N or, or just leave it as is. Uh, the get density data table function, as you see, it pulls out the distribution and the X and Y values. So that, that is the, the density data from from the previous function. Um, now let's take a look at it. Here's our density plot. Here is the beta in, in red, and this is our empirical data. So maybe you're just sort of exploring. You wanna know, you know, does my data look similar to a, to a beta? Does it look similar to a gamma? Um, that's sort of what the aim of this is, is to be. Um, talked about that. I'm going to move on from healthy yard data because we already talked about that. Really, it's all it has is the uh, synthetic data set. Um, now, tidy density, I'll kind of uh, go through this here. Um, this is really 
about making getting density and you know distribution data uh, in a tidy format. You know, you have like R norm, P norm, Q norm, D norm. Those are all functions for a normal distribution. I don't want to type out four functions. I want to type out one because I'm a lazy programmer and that's uh, what makes sense to me. So <clears throat> uh, tidy density, think of uh, the, all the functions will be tidy underscore and the distribution. So like I said, tidy normal equals R norm. Under the hood, it runs R norm, P norm, Q norm and density at the same time. I refer to these as tidy density or tidy distribution functions. And the syntax that is in all of them is dot n and dot num sims, where n is the number of randomly generated points you want. And num sims is how many simulations do you want to run? So let's generate five simulations of 100 points for a normal distribution and a Poisson distribution. Very simple, tidy normal. N equals N, num sims equals NS. In this case, 105. And then out it comes. And here we can see, if we run this function here, we can see, okay, here's my five simulations. Here's the mean value of the random variable, all pretty close, but not exact, which we expect. Same thing for tidy Poisson, exact same, uh, exact same syntax, exact same type of uh, output structure. So, like I said, what do we notice? We noticed that there was variation in the data. What does it look like? Hello, tidy autoplot. Now I chose uh, normal and Poisson specifically because one is a continuous distribution and one is discrete. Tidy autoplot um, will pick that up and plot appropriately. So if we pipe the tidy normal data into tidy autoplot, we get all five simulations of 100 points. And these uh, it will generate the subtitle of, okay, you had 100 points, five simulations. This was a Gaussian distribution. Your parameters mean zero standard deviation one. Uh, so, it, you know, on the plot, you can know, okay, this is exactly, you know, what was fed into it. Poisson, it's our histogram. Like I said, this one is discrete. So this is a more appropriate plot uh, than, than a line plot. Again, gives you the same data points, simulations. This is a Poisson, your lambda was one in this instance. Uh, what other plots are there? There's density, probability, quantile, and QQ, which are really the basic uh, plots that you're looking at with, with distribution uh, uh, data. They can be interactive plot plots or uh, static GG plot uh, objects. What if we want to combine distributions? I want to look at a Gaussian and a beta together. Why? I don't know, but maybe there's a certain you know, problem you're working on that you need to do this. Okay. No problem, tidy combined distribution and tidy combined auto plot. For tidy combined distributions, you can simply feed it the functions, tidy normal, tidy beta, and it will spit out the information. It will give you a distribution type as a factor. Say, okay, you passed me a Gaussian of mean zero standard deviation one and a tidy beta uh, will show up here as well. And this one was one, one, shape uh, one, shape two, both equal to one and the non-central parameter of zero. You can see the mean value is different for each one and we get the distribution type and its parameters out. What do they look like together? Just like this. The legend gives you the, uh, the name and parameters and the subtitle will give you how many data points and simulations were run. Here's same data, just in its, you know, the QQ plot. Now, what about multiple versions of, of one distribution? Say I wanna look at multiple versions of a Gaussian distribution. 
Well, we use tidy multi single dist. So multiple versions of a single distribution. It does require you to know the parameters of the tidy distribution function. Um, so you can refer to the help if need be. Um, and you, you put them in as a list. So here we give it mean, negative one, zero, and one. And we leave the standard uh, deviation as one. Um, under the hood, this creates a, uh, uh, um, uses, I think I used expand grid to get a combination of everything together. And if we summarize it, you can see, okay. It in fact looks like the random variable is pretty much equal to the parameters we gave the distribution. Now it's time to visualize. Well, here are our three different random normal distributions and their simulations. Again, it tells you what they are in the legend and it tells you in the subtitle uh, what was fed to it. Uh, another important note, if you go above nine simulations, the legend will shut off because otherwise it's, uh, it's just too cluttered. You can't, make, uh, you can't make heads or tails or anything. So I do do that under the hood. And the last thing we'll talk about is parameter estimation. Um, you have some data and you want to estimate its parameters. How do you do that? Well. Here, let's get the random uh, variable y from tidy beta. Again, it's 100 points. Uh, we give it a single simulation and we're gonna set the shape one to 0.1 and we're gonna say shape two is equal to 0.4. Now let's see how it works. Well, we have a, a function called util beta param estimate and they're all like this. So util normal param estimate, util log, normal param estimate, etc. You pass it your vector x and it does return a list object uh, of two different tibbles. So here we select off the parameter tibble and we I selected the distribution type, the two uh, parameters that are being estimated and the method. So here I have uh, this one spits out the Bayes method, the uh, uh, moment uh, estimator from the NIST and the moment method estimation from the EMV stats uh, package. As you can see, these were pretty close to what we fed the, the, the function, the tidy beta function. The combined data table that comes out of this will automatically generate the estimated parameter, you know, the estimated data, and it will take the vector you give it and create an empirical table so that you can take a look at the estimation and the actual together. You can pipe it right into tidy combined auto plot since there are two different distributions. Uh, and you can visualize that way. And here again in the legend, uh, it tells you, okay, empirical and beta, and here are the parameters that were estimated. And that, uh, that wraps it up. Went a little over, I apologize, but uh, I, I really appreciate uh, everybody uh, coming and, and listening. Yeah, thank you, Stephen. That was excellent. And if you don't mind, could we 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 tend to uh, like put up the full presentations on yeah. our SoCal our user group GitHub? Yeah. Do you mind if we get that from you at some point? You could send it to me, and we'll put it up. Yeah, I'll send you the link in. The, uh, I'll give it to you in LinkedIn. It's a I have it as an HTML file and an RMD file. Uh, perfect. I'll just no, that's send perfect. you a link. I'll send yeah. you a link right to the folder. Um, you want me to stop sharing? Uh, well, does anyone have any questions on any of the slides that uh, Stephen could go back and, and address? I just, um, 
put the option to people for to unmute yourselves if you want to ask a question. Thanks, Pablo. I have a quick question, um, Steve. Um, you went through all the stuff you've been working on, and it seems like a lot of work. Um, yeah. What was the what, what, what was the motivation to uh, uh, you sure. know create this and open source it? Yeah. So um, <clears throat> I work at you know what was up until our our merger a community hospital. The only person doing the data analytics was myself. I needed uh, methods I could use to speed up my work. I, I couldn't sit there and iterate uh, tediously. I had to find a way to get things done uh, quickly. Um, you know, since in smaller uh, facilities, not only do we do the data analysis, but we also do a lot of the regulatory reporting. So my time is sort of split. So I thought to myself, well, you know what? I can't be the only person uh, with this issue. So I went home and I said, all right, let's uh, start putting some stuff together, put it out there and uh, hopefully it's useful. And if uh, uh, if people find that it's useful, that's, that's great. Even if it's just one person, um, you know, if people find it uh, that it's lacking something and they want me to add functionality, Go ahead and send that GitHub issue request. I'll work on it. It's, uh, uh, you know, I view healthcare uh, a little differently than uh, I guess many uh, executives at hospitals do. I view it as a right. You know, we all have to live and breathe, and we should all have the opportunity to do it in a healthful manner. So I don't want to add to the burden of healthcare costs. This, this should be free. Anybody should be able to use it. Uh, I don't want anything for it. I just want it to be useful for you. Thank you. All right, well, I think that's it. Thank you, Stephen. This was great. Absolutely. Uh, all right. Well, I guess uh, thank you everyone for joining and stay tuned for the next meetup. Thank you so Thank much you. for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Bye. Pablo, are you able to stop the recording by chance? Oh, he's off. <laughs> Thanks again, Stephen. I appreciate it. Take care now. Have a great night. Uh, all right. You too.